powerful video. Good morning, and I have the awesome task of introducing our keynote speaker today. Dr. Yohuru Williams is Distinguished University Chair and Professor of History and Founding Director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas. He received his PhD from Howard University in 1998. Dr. Williams is the author of Black Politics, White Power, Civil Rights, Black Power, and Black Panthers in New Haven, uh, Blackwell, uh, 2006, Rethinking the Black Freedom Movement, Rutledge, 2015, and Teaching Beyond the Textbook, Six Investigative Strategies, Corum Press, 2008. I've had the opportunity to observe Dr. Williams um, in a conversation with he, myself, Dr. Curtis DeYoung, and Jim Baer, and I was so impressed and moved by his wisdom and his knowledge, and we said, we have to have him come and participate in our program. So without further ado, I bring to you Dr. Yohuru Williams. Thank you, Pastor. I am going to pretend because I know what I'm doing. Everybody can see that? Good morning, everyone. How are you? I am honored to be with you today. It's a hard act to follow after last evening, so I'll do my best. It's a hard act to follow. Um, uh, so much of the passion that was expressed last night around this issue. And I want to be clear, when Ayanna talked about the importance of recognizing that there's not discovery, it's the reason that I call my work historical recovery. You ever lose your glasses and you're looking for your glasses? and you'll search all over your home looking for those glasses. And when you find them, they're sitting in a place and you go, how could I have missed it? They were there the whole time. You didn't see them, but they were there. They, they weren't disturbed. They weren't hiding from you. They were there waiting to be recovered. Now, I wanna be clear in talking to you today. My talk is called Good Words Will Not Give Me Back My Children. Truth-telling and historical recovery is the foundations for racial justice. And I know a lot of people are reading um, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, and I think you're going to turn me on, right, uh, Cody? Thank you. So I'm going to walk. Got to get my steps in. There we go. I know a lot of people are reading uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, and it's a great book. And in the beginning of that book, she has this wonderful story that's taken from the experience of Nazi Germany. And it's around this image of an individual who is the man in the crowd. And you can see all the people there uh, raising the Heil, Heil Hitler salute. And there's one gentleman there who's got his arms folded. And you can tell he's the person that's standing out. He's the man in the crowd. He's the person that says, not me. As for me and my house, ha ha, right? We're we not going to play this game. Like, I know where this is headed. Now, what I love about this image is that in a lot of ways, it's very powerful. But I want to be clear, as I bring greetings to you from three very incredible women that I work with, Randy Roth at Interfaith Action, uh, my good friend, um, Gay Adams Massey from the YWCA St. Paul, and President Julie Sullivan at the University of St. Thomas. Sometimes the reason we have problems, we're looking for the man in the crowd. And sometimes the best man in the crowd is a woman. Thank you. Just got to say that up front. I also want to be clear that today, what we want to do is go through the process of thinking through what James Baldwin talked about when he said, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way that people look at reality, then you can change it. I don't expect that I'm going to tell you much that's new today, but I hope that I'm going to alter the way that we're thinking about this moment and what we can accomplish together in community as we reimagine what it means to be warriors for truth in the hopes of accomplishing justice. I also want to begin with some wisdom from Dr. King who said, shallow understanding from goodwill of people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. 
It's the well-intentioned that often do the most damage because they don't have that sweet spirit of Jim Bear. You know, it's funny when we were on that call, Pastor, I remember uh, Jim Bear and I've talked, just first time meeting in, in person, but some people you meet and there's just something about them. You know what I'm talking about? You feel like you've known them your whole life, like you were supposed to be in community with them, like God put you together for some purpose, that you're supposed to do something great, that you were supposed to be in that space at that time, that there's a larger calling coming from that connection. That's kind of how I feel about Jim Bear. I was told by somebody at, my, at the university, he said, you know, he speaks very highly of you. You, you. you two must have worked together a long time. I go, no, we just met. Sometimes the universe puts you together, puts you in a space because you were intended to be there because there's something that you can't see, haha, -ha, some purpose that you have that needs to be fulfilled and it's best not to get in the way. Now, when we talk about this from Dr. King, I think sometimes we do Dr. King a disservice because we like to cherry pick from speeches of a man that wrote three books, countless articles, was a scholar, earned a PhD from BU. So I wanna be very clear that Dr. King in his book, Strength of Love wrote, sincerity and conscientiousness in themselves are not enough. We got to stop with this. I feel really bad about what happened last May. I'm conscientiously trying to be a better person. I'm checking my privilege and my uncon. We got to stop. Because as King pointed out, history has proven that these noble virtues may degenerate into tragic vices. You know, those Indian schools started because somebody said, it would be great to take their land, but if we could have some wonderful justification to go along with it. Hmm. We do this all the time. Noble virtue, tragic vice. Continues. Nothing in the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Now, look, I'm not supposed to be political and we're in the house of God, so, but I'm, I, it's just truth telling. We spent four years with somebody in the highest elective office in this country who demonstrates the danger of sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. And I also want to be clear in saying that to you that King says, devoid of intelligence, goodness and conscientious will become brutal forces leading to shameful crucifixions. Last night, uh, in the presentation, she talked about the Requimento, which was the document that they would read when they would um, encounter the indigenous people for the first time. The Spanish would read it. Now, that document was supposed to um, prevent bloodshed. Uh, that's what they said it was supposed to do. But really what it was was a justification. What they read it, they say, we're giving you the opportunity to surrender your land to us, to surrender to us. And you have the opportunity to convert um, to Christianity. But they would read it in Spanish from the deck of the ship before they got off the ship. And then they would come in and burn the village down and say, how come you didn't know we gave you the opportunity, even though we were reading it in a different language, but we were fair and justified in what we did because we followed the policies and practices and procedures that were established in a home office. And, give me a break. Never must the church tire of reminding people they have a moral responsibility to be intelligent. And that means facing and dealing with that hard history. See, Wilkerson talks in that book about racism being like an invisible program. And in fact, it, it makes me, she talks about this in the book, but it reminded me of something. You guys remember Y2K? Remember that back in 2000? People thought the world was going to end. I'll never forget this as long as I live. I remember my family, we were, you know, I, it was 1158. I had a cooler, cell phone, batteries, radio. Don't know what we were going to do with that. Because people thought that when the, the, the time turned over, the world was going to be destroyed. So we got on our knees at 11.59 and we prayed and at 12.01, the world was still there. <laughs> and the next day, I think it was Peter Jennings or somebody was on the news and they said, you know, the, the problem is people were concerned about this happening, but the reality is that the program was so well built that it's built to withstand. See, racism 
is so well built. So well structured. It's the invisible program that runs on. When, when Jim Bear says, you know, we have to talk about, before we talk about original sin, we got to connect these in a way that we understand how they all contribute to the, the, the disease, the program that's been running in the background. And every time we think it's a Y2K, oh my goodness, look what happened to Emmett Till. Oh my goodness, look what happened to Breonna Taylor. Oh my goodness, look what happened to George Floyd. And it continues to run in the background. We didn't do our work. The other thing that Wilkerson talks about that, and I, I had to choose a creepy picture for this. Um, Wilkerson said that racism is like an old house with an infrared light. Now I'm gonna tell you something as a homeowner, multiple homeowner, don't buy no old house. And if you do, don't make the mistake of going on a home inspection after you've put down your money. You know, Stephen King talks about this in an article called Why We Crave Horror Films. And Stephen King said, you know, people sometimes misunderstand horror films because they think horror films are just about the slasher, right? You go and you're afraid. What, he says they work on different levels. When you're nine years old, what scares you about the horror film is that your parents just bought a house and there's a demon in the, the, the closet that comes out when your parents put you to bed. And you've told them there's a demon in the closet and your mom gets mad at you and sends you to your room. And if she's closing the door on you, the demon's in the closet going, it's gonna be a great time tonight. <laughs> but when you're 36, and King says, he remembers this vividly when he went to see the Amityville Horror House, horror movie. There was a couple sitting in front of them. And as they were watching the movie, the wife leaned over to the husband as the green stuff with slime was oozing out of the wall and she looked at the husband, she says, Oh my God, the bills. Horror films work on different levels. When you're 36, you just sunk your life savings into a home, right? You got it for a song and it's falling apart and you realize that your kid doesn't want to sleep in the bedroom, the pipes are making noise and somebody's going, get out. You got problems. <laughs> Don't lose me here because I use that as an example because Wilkerson says, unaddress the ruptures and die Diagonal cracks will not fix themselves. The toxins will not go away, but rather they will spread, leach, mutate as they already have. That's what we're dealing with. So we went from lynching to police brutality. We went from 1968, Mexico City, and, and Tommy Smith and, and, and John Carlos with the black sock feet to represent poverty, the beads to represent lynching, the, the fist that everybody says was black power, but they were saying it was actually about solidarity with oppressed people from around the world. That's what 68 was about to Colin Kaepernick. And people go, well, but they're, but they're different. Last night, we learned about the native indigenous origins of the NFL. Somebody please call the Washington football team. In fact, Wilkerson says, and this is very important for us, live with it long enough and the unthinkable becomes normal. Exposed over the generations, we learn to believe that the incomprehensible is the way life is supposed to be. Always been like that, always will be like that, can't do nothing to change it. Except then came the Minnesota Council of Churches that said, we're going to do a 10-year plan, and it's got like that, right? You, 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 you're messing with the foundations a little bit. See, ignorance is not bliss. I'll tell you this story very quickly. We bought a home and had black mold in the, in the attic. I remember I called my friend Steve Newton. I said, there's black mold in the attic. He says, I'll come over and take a look at it. He came down. He said, burn it. I said, what are you talking about? He said, burn it. I was like, are you kidding right now? He goes, no, burn it. <laughs> You set your house on fire because you were in trouble. I thought he was kidding. Then I called the mold remediation people and they were like $30,000 for us to come and remediate the, the mold in your attic. So my uh, ex-wife said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going to burn it. <laughs> I did not burn a house down, y'all. We in church. You need to relax. What it did was call my good friend Baruti Capano and he had a company, BW Chem Dry, and they came to my house and he and I crawled up into that crawl space and we spent a weekend with bleach scrubbing that mold out and when we were done and it was pristine i put that house on sale 
And I spent the next three and a half months while they were bringing people in and out of that house, going up there with a toothbrush at night and scrubbing off the black mold to keep it at bay long enough that I could sell it and pass it on to some. Now, I feel bad about that. And that was immoral. But I want to be very clear with you. The mold wasn't going to go away because I put a little bleach on it. The mold wasn't going to disappear because I had been vigilant and go. The mold needed um, a... a, a you needed a response to that toxin that had to be stronger than the toxin itself because that's the mutation principle that allows it to come back. It's like coronavirus where we thought we got this with the vaccine and along came Delta. And then you ask me, why is the picture of the young girl with the doll there? Because last night we talked about epigenetics and I want to be very clear about this is what Clint Kenneth Clark accomplished in Brown versus Board of Education with the doll experiment where you then don't know the unconscious damage that's done to you. See, now I can't ever be comfortable in a house. I go in attics that aren't even mine, looking for mold. <laughs> Everybody's laughing, but I just had heart surgery July 26. Second one. Because I got post-traumatic history syndrome because so many horrible things I, I was 15 years old the first time that my heart went off the rails the doctor told me you have atrial flutter then it became atrial fibrillation then it became a huge problem that, that might result in a stroke if you don't have it addressed now where did that come from at 15 years old what could I have possibly done in my 15 years on the planet to inherit but then when I found out, which I don't have time to talk to you about tonight, my family history, it's very different. I want to be clear in, in talking with you today. You know, this is what happened to my colleague last night, and I'm doing it too. I'm supposed to be talking to you about something. I'm wasting time. I want to be clear. All stories, they say, come to us as gifts. Equipping churches to grow in love of God and neighbor, reach new people, and heal bro a broken world. In fact, you already had the mission statement read to you, but I want to go someplace else with you. I want to go where my um, good friend Curtis DeYoung talks about when he says, and this is important, reconciliation occurs between equals. That's why you can't talk about reconciliation until you've done the work of leveling the relationships. Now that's very important because people want to start with reconciliation when they're not equal. Like I'm still up here and I'm coming to you going, well, I see the stifling poverty and the housing inequality and the, but how can we reconcile this? No, we can't reconcile this till we create some type of level playing field where that dialogue is meaningful because we all have skin in the game in terms of the problems that we're attempting to address. In fact, Curtis in saying that reminds me of the principles that go under historical recovery, which is truth telling is one of the principal foundations of historical recovery. You gotta start with the truth. In fact, it's biblical from this standpoint, Martin Luther King talked about it this way. The great majority of Americans are suspended between these opposing attitudes. They're uneasy with injustice, but they're unwilling yet to pay a significant price to eradicate it. They don't want to deal with the mold. They don't want to climb up into the attic. They don't want to be in your attic. They don't want to be in my attic. They don't want to be in Minneapolis, Minneapolis's attic. They don't want to be in Minnesota's attic. They don't want to deal with the problem in a way that meaningfully would allow us to go, you know, I, I'm a product of Jesuit education. The Jesuits love the quote Ignatius of St. Leola. Ignatius was f uh, famous for saying to young people, go forth and set the world on fire. My response to that is, it's not a good thing to tell people to go set the world on fire unless you tell them what to burn. That's real dangerous. What I love about what King puts there is that it's biblical. We in church today, so you know, I, I can do the scholar thing, but don't invite me to a church because you know all academics secretly really want to be, all rock stars want to be athletes, athletes want to be rock stars, and historians actually secretly want to be ministers. Ha ha. <laughs> we go and think we teach in a class and, you know, we doing all, the, and the students are like, what? Look, I want to read to you from the Gospel of Luke. I want to be clear that the reason that truth hurts is that wounds produce narratives. So I want to talk about the story of the prodigal son in the context that Curtis meant to remind us how reconciliation becomes possible if it's a conversation between equals. I'm going to start 
verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Like, why are you starting there, Dr. Williams? The good part of this story is when he, he goes off and squanders the inheritance, right? No, because this is a story of multiple loss. And the real person that's lost or in danger of being lost at the end of the story ain't the one that went off and came home. Ha ha. And it's surely not the dad who's willing to give all in search of the coin, right? But it's the older son who's saying, when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother's come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted cat because um, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me your young goat so I could celebrate with friends. But when this son of yours who squandered his property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found but i want to be clear here the older brother had to tell his truth there could be reconciliation but the older brother had to say this is how i'm feeling with regard to what happened or i'm not going to be right in this situation right i'm not going to be able to engage with him in a way that's going to be productive for us as a family I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to show up in community and be productive because I'm always gonna carry the wound of what happened here when I wasn't able to reconcile why this group of people were able to engage in genocide, ha ha, Jim Crow segregation, lynching, not held accountable for it. People get their feelings hurt when you say this and look, I, look, we have to talk about it. I, in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, um, I was on uh, NPR talking about the Duluth lynching of 1920. And the host said to me, you keep making comparisons between George Floyd and or do, you, do you see that as a lynching? I said, no, it's not a lynching. But I wanna, what I want to point out to you is that if you study the Duluth lynching, what you uncover in that story is that it was the complicity of the Duluth police that facilitated the lynching. They had the young men in custody. They were in jail. But then the chief of police came out and issued a statement where he said, and I quote, I will not risk one drop of Anglo-Saxon blood in defense of those prisoners. And when that got out in the community, people showed up and said, we can take the jail. Ain't going to be no resistance here. That's what facilitated it. Look, it gets uncomfortable because those wounds, if they're not addressed, become the basis for all kinds of challenges that then have to be reconciled at some point. In fact, this young woman is named Savannah Smith. What you see her holding up there is a jar of, of soil from a lynching that took place in Wilmington, Delaware in 1903. I wrote an article on that lynching when I first came to Delaware State University in 1998, and I went to Delaware State University, and the first thing they said to me is, you're gonna be teaching Delaware history. I was like, I didn't know where Delaware was on a map before I got here. So now I gotta teach Delaware history, we got a problem. So being strategic, I decided to begin my study of Delaware history through African-American history, the lens of African-American history. The first thing I came across was this account of this lynching from 1903, where they said there was a minister at the Olivet Presbyterian Church who delivered a sermon demanding that this man, George White, be lynched, and that 5,000 people showed up at the workhouse and dragged him out and lynched him. Burned him at the stake, because that's one of the misconceptions about lynching is that was hanging. They burned him at the stake. So I was like, if this happened the way that this person wrote about this, this is the only place in the country that the minister was run out of town. I was like, this sounds to me like somebody's trying to create reconciliation in a non-reconciliation moment. So somebody got to go uncover, recover that truth. So I wrote this article on it. Among the other things that I determined was that that minister, whose name was Robert Elwood, not only was he not run out of town, he became so celebrated for preaching a sermon so fiery that it would cause 5,000 people to storm the workhouse and lynch a man, that he had to move his sermons, move his services from the Presbyterian church to the opera house to accommodate the throngs who came from states around to hear this man preach. When he left Wilmington, Delaware two years later, it wasn't because he was run out of town. He went off to become a, a, a pastor 
at the Leavenworth, Kansas Presbyterian Church, which was a much better perch for him and was still celebrated. And it wasn't until he was implicated in an improper relationship with a choir girl. Ha ha, because you got to do your research. I went to Kansas on that one. So I wrote the article and then this young girl Savannah Shepard comes along and she says, you know, we need a lynching memorial for George White. And people push back on it. So, you know, George White was guilty, right? She said, that's not the point. She's quoting Khalil Muhammad from the condemnation of blackness. The metric is not guilt or in innocence. The metric is how a community feels empowered to violate due process of law. And what we're reminding people in that moment is not of solely the life of George White, but how do we prevent this from ever happening again? You want to know what I'm talking about? I couldn't find it to put it up here, but you can look it up on Google later on. Look at the official report of the murder of George White seven hours after it happened, before the cell phone video and all that good stuff got out. Because the official report reads nothing like what we all saw. Anyway, Savannah got the marker up and they put the marker up and three days later, some people came and took it down. So they raised money and they put it up again and they started a Delaware Truth and Reconciliation Commission. They were doing all this work on it. And I'm telling you all this because I eventually got invited to go back and, and I said, you know, there's another lynching that took place here in 1861, a guy named Jacob Hamilton. I said, well, what do you know about that lynching? So I wrote an article on that. And it was tied to a very historic home called Belmont Hall in Delaware. Belmont Hall is where they hold wedding receptions. It was the home of the third governor of the state of Delaware. It is on the National Register of Historic Places. And what people didn't know is that in 1861, they accused this field hand of breaking into the home to try to ravage the daughters. In fact, it looked like it was a botched robbery. Um, that it happened once before, and they had no evidence to indicate that this individual that they dragged out in the middle of the day and hung from an old willow tree had been guilty of this. But they did it, and then they covered it up. And so when I wrote the article, the president of Delaware Historical Society said, you know, we got your article, we think it's great, but we have to send it to Belmont Hall because we don't want to surprise them. I was like, oh, well, you can do that all you want, because thank God uh, for open publishing. If you don't publish it, it's going to be on the net in six hours anyway. So I suggest you publish it, but, you know. So they sent it out to Belmont Hall, and he wrote me. He's a good guy. I'm only being, you know, kidding about this. He called me, and he said, Yuhuru, when we call them, they said, hold on. We want, you to, we want to talk to one of the relatives about this. And when they talked to the relative, the relative said, oh, my goodness, we've been waiting for this. We always knew this day would come. That sickened me. Because the, the mold, the evil was there. And they knew. And they just put it in the attic. People said, why did you get into studying this to begin with? How did you end up studying lynching in Delaware? Now, people I have a forthcoming book on this and they go, I did you, I went, it's bad enough you moved there, but how'd you end up studying lynching there? I said, because when I was there, my daughter Ella's with me. She was born in 2001, or she was born in 2003. My other daughter Ace is born in 2001. I'm about to have a child. And literally, March 9th, 2001, a gentleman by the name of Reginald Hanna, an African-American, was killed in the back of a police cruiser. Now, that shouldn't be surprising to anyone. That happens all the time, unfortunately. That's part of the program. But what disgusted me is that the next day in the paper, an editorial in the Delaware State News declared, this was in print, and I quote, in America, it should be like when I was a little girl. Kill them. Take them out. Hang them on trees or the whipping post. Why don't they still do that? Now, I called the newspaper, wrote the newspaper. I'm Dr. Williams. I'd like to know why you would publish such an incendiary they said, you didn't know there was a whipping post in Delaware? You didn't know we were the last state in the union to abolish the whipping post? We abolished the pillory in 1911. The last public whip whipping in Delaware was in 1956. That hurt me so bad, because when I started to think about that and put it together, when I witnessed what happened to George Floyd, I was thinking Rodney King, I was thinking 
Jacob Hamilton. I was thinking George White. I was thinking what happened to my great grandfather, great grand uncle who was killed by the police in Danville, Virginia in 1937. And I was also thinking, what of the privilege of this person who writes into the newspaper and declares something that is so morally reprehensible, the privilege that has to go along with that, with no whatsoever sense of, wow. Look, I'm going to tell you guys, I mean, look, we, we're being overly familiar anyway, so I'll be overly familiar. Made all kinds of inappropriate jokes with you anyway. Might as well tell you this one. We just celebrated the anniversary of 9-11, so I'm talking to this gentleman, and he is really upset with me. He goes, I understand the ecumenical focus and why we don't want to talk about the complicity of Muslims in this, but they attacked us and it was terrorism. And I said to him, you ever seen that meme, Native Americans fighting terrorism since 1492? He said, well, how's that connected to our conversation? I said, I want to be very clear with you. He was, and they said, this was his big thing. Do you believe that they believe that they were going to get 40 virgins if they do this? How stupid can they be? I was like, you know, I'm not even going to deal with that part of it, but let me deal with this. It ain't no worse than people that went off by the Dawes Act and told they could go west. And if they got out there first, they could take the first land that they saw. And they were stealing that from people. And that was terrorism. And we don't talk about that. See, wounds compound wounds. And if you're not prepared to deal with one, like I'm happy to talk about your cut, our cut, which is 9-11. We were all deeply touched and hurt by what happened on that day. But if you want me to mourn with you about the slice on your leg over here, then we got to talk about my broken arm too. Follow me? And if you don't want to talk about the broken arm and you want to pretend that the broken arm is not there, we got a little bit of a problem because, again, those wounds are just going to compound in such a way that people are going to be in a situation where we're just all, you know, playing the competitive harm Olympics rather than getting down to what Jim Bear talked about in the very beginning, which is let's get at the heart of the original sin. See, I want to tell you, I only got like 15 minutes left, so I'll go quick. I want to put you to sleep. You know what they say, don't talk too long. I don't want people to people be happy to see you stand up and then happy to see you sit down. We're not trying to go for the ladder. Um, I want to talk about the metaphor of the knee for a second with you because when Al Sharpton came here, and I'm not going to play this, but I think you'll remember this. He said, George Floyd's story has been the story of black folks in America. Because he said, for, ever since 400 years, the reason we could never be who we wanted to be is you had your knee on our neck. Because remember that? In fact, I will play a... George Floyd's story has been the story of black folks. Because ever since 401 years ago, the reason we could never be who we wanted and dreamed to be in is you kept your knee on our neck. We were smarter than the underfunded schools you put us in, but you had your knee on our neck. We could run corporations and not hustle in the street, but you had your knee on our neck. We had creative skills. We could do whatever anybody else could do. But we couldn't get your knee off our neck. What happened to Floyd happens every day in this country in education, in health services, and in every area of American life. It's time for us to stand up in George's name and say, get your knee off our necks. And, and African-Americans, we both know the knee. D. Brown wrote a book George. called Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. We know the metaphor of the knee because the knee has been applied in both communities in that way, in housing, in education, in access to places of public accommodation, in unfair labor practices, in Jim Crow justice, in the most intractable ways. So when we talk about the stereotypes of the welfare queen or the drunken Indian, they all go back to, in some sense, the sin 
Look, don't, don't get me started. It's going to be a long day here. Let me go with you to this cartoon from 1879. Because, see, sometimes you can talk, but, see, I'm a historian. I can back it up. So here we are in 1879. It's this political cartoon from Thomas Nast. It shows a Chinese immigrant um, who is reading off the Chinese problem. And these were the laws, the exclusion laws that were passed in, in the West to try to prevent Japanese immigra uh, Chinese immigration into the United States to work on the railroads. And you have him talking to this Native American gentleman, and in the back is an African American gentleman. What's he reading here? The Chinese must go, a real American. The Chinese problem, prohibit Chinese immigration, all further immigration to the state of the Chinese and all other persons ineligible to become citizens in the United States under the naturalization laws. Laws providing for their banishment, foreigners not wanted, patent the Irish, ha ha. See, Thomas Nass was playing with something here, playing, and he keeps going. Lager beer government, we must have social order, order by Fritz. He's saying the Irish came, the Germans came as immigrants, and then they turn around. See, I was one of those people that was posting this online when Trump was talking about a Muslim ban and all that foolishness, right? Remember that? I didn't expect that he could read it because he held the Bible upside down, but I posted it. <laughs> no nothingism of the past. Down with the Irish, down with the Dutch. The caption reads, red gentleman to yellow gentleman. Pale face afraid, You'll crowd him out the way he did me. And the African-American over the back, note the day, 1879. Civil Wars fought 1861 to 1865. Hayes-Tilden Compromise, 1877 ends it. 1879 would have been two years after Hayes-Tilden. And short of 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson, which makes segregation the law of the land. And over the head of the black man is written the words, my day is a coming. Now, I shouldn't be able to do this if it isn't baked into the history that we should look. Did, did it not convince you there? If we think about the metaphor of the knee with regard to African-Americans, we see the knee in the form of chattel slavery. We see the knee in the form of the failure of reconstruction. You had a moment in this country where you had a 13th Amendment, 1865, which abolishes slavery, a 14th Amendment, which confers citizenship, a 15th Amendment, which everybody says gave black people the right to vote. That's a lie. The 15th Amendment says the right to vote shall not be abridged or denied based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Said nothing about gender. That's why we needed a 20. See, that's what I mean by unfinished revolutions and not cleaning out all the mold. See, you could have done it in that moment. You didn't have to go back upstairs with the toothbrush. But you keep, and then, you know, people don't know that Native people don't get that. And indigenous people don't get that right until 1923. Mm. Unencumbered. Mm. We know this, this, this cycle of, of wounds, right? So what does the knee look like for African-Americans? The black codes, poll tax, literacy tests, grandfather clause, Jim Crow justice, right? It's not just what happened to George Floyd, it's the history and legacy of policies, practices, and procedures that continue to perpetuate injustice in a way that make our society incapable of living up to the aspirational language articulated by the founders in the documents that we venerate and then desecrate on a daily basis. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, except the right to be able to go get a Skittles and iced tea if you're Trayvon Martin, or the right to be able to say, I didn't pass a phony check, and oh, I'm claustrophobic, please don't put me in the back of this cruiser, or the right to say, that's my land, you can't take it, or the right to say that, please don't say that you've discovered the corpses of children that were kidnapped, call it what it was, kidnapping. Look, don't get me started because, see, I got to tell you a little bit of my story. I grew up in the 80s, right? As a kid, and I grew up in Connecticut, so I know the Nanticoke, Delaware, and I know that those tribes. I grew up, and our, our um, connection to Native culture was the crying Indian ad. Anybody remember that? It was like, look at what they've done to the land, and the noble Indian came out to remind Americans that highway blue. It was the most, when I was a kid, it scared me because I thought he was going to come take us out. <laughs> Found out years later, it wasn't even a Native American, it wasn't even an indigenous person that played that role. It was an Italian actor who played the role, and he died because he was a smoker, which I thought was kind of, you know, interesting. <laughs> but I want to point out that they did this, and I grew up in a culture where African Americans on TV were always kids adopted by white people. 
different strokes, even silver spoons. Ricky Schroeder, Alfonso Ribeiro got his start as the adopted son of, it was always like, we're, I would turn on cartoons, now we got, you know, Black Panther, right? I said, why can't he just be Panther? Let me stop. Um, anyway, but we have Black Panther now. When I was a kid, the Super Friends were all white and then they went multicultural. They added Apache Chief, Black Vulcan, Samurai, and El Dorado. You guys think I'm being funny now and, and saying this, I'm telling you, that was deeply, now I look back on this and I wonder where that wound comes from. Where, you know what, uh, I'm, I'm not being funny and saying this, but Apache Chief and, and Black Vulcan were so stereotypical. They did damage to the psyche of young people in that moment. Look, don't, don't lose me here. I'm going to tell you my story around the Washington football team. See, there were no black quarterbacks in the 80s either. In 1988, Jimmy the Greek came out and said, you guys remember this, I'm not going to read it to you, that the reason you couldn't have um, the blacks were better athletes is because they've been bred since the Civil War. I remember that. And then Doug Williams won the Super Bowl for the Washington football team in Minneapolis. And I was over the moon. Because I was like, when we were kids, I'll tell you how deep the psycholog psychological damage is. We were like, we would just, it'd just be just like a real football game if we had a white quarterback. Because we never seen any black people play quarterback. So I said to my dad, you got to get me a Washington Redskins hat. I got to get one. I need one. His last name's Williams. My name's Last Williams. The lies are set up. That's my uncle. <laughs> my father, who was, uh, is a musician and a African history, Geechee Gullah, South Carolina born, organic intellectual, for the first time ever disappointed me. And he said, you will not wear that hat in my house. That was an education. I said, why, Dad? Like, I'm hurt. He said, because of what's on the hat and what that team represents. That was the first time I even thought to think about someone else's pain. I knew it from my lens and how I experienced it. But in that moment in 1988 and all the celebratory joy over Doug Williams winning the Super Bowl, my daddy had to remind me in that moment, that suffering is real. And that hat, look, Stokely Carmichael, who gets beat up by people all the time, is all this foolishness over critical race theory. Folks, I'm gonna be clear, this isn't critical race theory. This is just good history. Like, this is what happens when we ask people to read. Just, just read, right? Just, just read. What, what does Stokely Carmichael write in the New York Review of Books in 1966? I remember that when I was a boy, I used to go to Tarzan movies on Saturday. White Tarzan would beat up the black natives, and I would sit there yelling, kill the beasts, kill the savages, kill them. I was saying, kill me. It was as if I were a Jewish boy watching Nazis taking Jews off the concentration camps and cheered them on. Today, I want the chief to beat the hell out of Tarzan and send him back to Europe. You read that and it's hurtful, but I also want to be clear here that as a kid, I played cowboys and Indians. And I never wanted to be on the side of the Indians. See, so we got to talk about this in a way that if, if I can make it basic enough and we can understand the harm at that level, then I can get you to the next, you know, iteration of talking about the deeper philosophical underpinnings of what Franz Fanon talks about in The Wretched of the Earth. But I just want to be, begin here through the lens of a young boy who's saying, this is what I grew up with, so how could I know any better? And I didn't understand the internalized damage it was doing to me in the process. There was no Wakanda forever. And what hurts so bad is that when we talk about the experience of our indigenous brothers and sisters, you can put your finger right on it. We can talk about middle passage or we can talk about middle passages. We can talk about genocide or we can talk about genocides. Look, you want to talk about the knee, I'm not even going to deal with before the Civil War, just for parity. Let me just deal after the Civil War in terms of our native brothers and sisters, right? 
1868, 1871. That's the knee. We know what that looks like. That's the wound that produces the narrative that drives the conversation away. This is what has to be uncovered and redressed to create the equality where we can finally be in a place to at least pretend that we're talking about reconciliation and not simply, I feel better because we've acknowledged it. We put up a marker, never mention it again. And I want to do so in a way that organically people recognize this. Uh, I think this is from 1987. Protesters gathered a northern Wisconsin boat landing in the late 80s, spear an Indian and save a walleye because they were denying the right of indigenous people in that moment to be able to hunt and fish on their ancestral lands. And this was the response. And this is not 1960. This is in 1860. This is 1980 when I was home watching Apache Chief and Black Vulcan in El Dorado on the Super Friends. And when my daddy was saying, you will not wear that hat. Look, what does all this have to do with your topic, Dr. Williams? You done confused us. I have no idea where you're going with any of this. Let me end with you today by saying this. They appeal for justice, and I want to tell you where the title of my talk comes from, and it comes from Chief Joseph. In 1877, he fought back against the knee. And what happened in that moment is that what he did is he went to Washington, D.C. to respond to the federal government that was trying to strip Native Americans once again of their rights. And he gives a speech and he says to the people of the United States, right? And I want you to understand his appeal. These are his words. Words do not pay for my dead people. They do not pay for my country now overrun by white men. They do not protect my father's grave. They do not pay for all my horses and cattle. Good words will not give me back my children. Good words will not give me my people good health and stop them from dying. Good words will not get my people a home where they can live in peace and take care of themselves. I'm tired of talk that comes to nothing. That was 1877, before the cartoon I showed you from 1879. And I want to be clear, this isn't today where we're talking about cultural, social determinants of health and racism. And no, no, no. This is 1877 out of the mouth of an individual who's living and experiencing in that moment. And he's articulated every issue that we talk about today with a clarity and directness that cannot be avoided, that it is an indictment on us in 2021 that I could read that to you here in September. And as my sister said, as we think about the illuminating light of autumn, we're not illuminated by this. And it points the way that we can't have another season of good talk. <laughs> We, we heard a couple of great speeches Friday and Saturday. Well, one good one Friday and one rambling one Saturday. But the reality is, good words are not enough. Listen to where um, Chief Joseph went. Treat all humanity alike. Now we go to great pains to not gender people. And yet, if we look at what's coming out of the indigenous culture in that moment, an ungendered respect for humanity, for life. Could have learned a lot, saved us a lot of ink and a lot of trouble. Follow. If the white man wants to live in peace with the Indian, he can live in peace. There need be no trouble. Treat all men alike. Give them all the law, same law. Give them all an even chance to live and grow. All men were made by the same great spirit chief. They're all brothers. The earth is the mother of all people and all people should have equal rights upon it. I've asked some of the great white chiefs where they get their authority to say that the Indian, that he shall stay in one place while he sees white men going where they please. They cannot tell me. I only ask of the government to be treated as all other men are treated. Let me be a free man, free to travel, free to stop, free to work, free to trade where I choose, free to choose my own teachers, free to follow the religion of my fathers, free to think and talk and act for myself, and I will obey every law or submit to the penalty. But if you can't do that, Let me show you another political cartoon from 1885. Shows a policeman ordering an indigenous person to move on from the voting polls. Because we know 
that that whole domestic dependent nations treaty stuff also denied indigenous people the right to vote. So they couldn't influence the political process, so they couldn't vote the white chief out. So the white chief list, listens to your pretty, your good words, and then the white chief does what the white chief wants to do because your good words have no way of stinging him in a way that he has to be responsive to what you shared. Three more minutes, four more minutes. Let me make this comparison for you. Frederick Douglass, 1865. If I, if I can't make the two of these rhyme, then I've wasted your time this morning. Frederick Douglass is invited by the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society to give a meditation on what black people want in the aftermath of the Civil War. And so Douglass begins his speech to this predominantly white audience by saying, look, you want to know what black people want? I'll tell you what we want. What shall we do with the Negro was the question. I've had but one answer from the beginning. Do nothing with us. Your doing with us has already played the mischief with us. Do nothing with us. If the apples will not remain on the tree of their own strength, if they're worm eaten at the core, if they're early ripe and disposed to fall, let them fall. I'm not for tying or fasting them on the tree in any way except by nature's plan. And if they will not stay there, let them fall. And if the Negro cannot stand on his own legs, let him fall also. All I ask is give him a chance to stand on his own legs. Got to do this with you. People read that and they go, I don't understand why you just shared that with us, Dr. Williams, because that's social Darwinism. And the reason that Douglas is doing that is he's a contemporary of Charles Darwin, who wrote The Origin of Species in 1859 and Herbert Spencer applied it to human populations. And so what Douglas is doing is playing the game. This is your philosophy? Let me turn it on you. And this, is what you this is what you say you want. I'm just going to ask you to do what you say that you do. But he goes one step further. And I'm going to tell you now, Douglas is about to foreshadow in the next 100 years of U.S. history. 1865. All I ask is give him a chance to let him alone. If you see him on his way to what? Fast forward to... Brown versus Board of Education. Fast forward to Little Rock, 1957. Fast forward to New York City in the late 1960s when the Ocean Hill Brownsville. Fast forward to Boston in uh, 1970 when Boston is desegregating and they have riots in the city of Boston. White residents are riot uh, of Boston because they don't want busing. Fast forward to Connecticut, which is under the long, longest desegregation orders in history. That's the North, too. Fast forward to Minnesota in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, where we were told that Minnesota lags behind every state in the union in educational outcomes for students of color, namely African-Americans, even behind Mississippi. But we don't know what to do. Like we want to, we want to fight back. We just, we don't know where to. Douglas, number two. If you see him going to the dinner table at a hotel, let him go. He's talking about access to places of public accommodation. Fast forward to the sit-ins of the 1950s and 1960s, the lunch counters. Fast forward to Trayvon Martin just walking through a neighborhood. Fast forward. Fast forward to Breonna Taylor asleep in her home. Fast forward to Ahmed Arbery jogging through a neighborhood. See, I shouldn't be able to do this over time, and there shouldn't be. Douglas continues. If you see him going to the ballot box, if you see him going to vote, what we talk about now, we've been talking about since last year, right? With uh, Raphael Warnock and Stacey Abrams and South Carolina and felony disfranchisement and why we need a, 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 a John Lewis Voting Rights Act to up. Now, we, play this game with me for just a second because I'm definitely over time. Just for a second, you got a 15th Amendment in 1870. That wasn't enough. You passed a force act to enforce the 15th Amendment in 1870 and a Ku Klux Klan Act in 1871, a, a Voting Rights Act of 1965 which had to keep be read up and read up. And then you got Shelby County versus Holder in 2013, which cut out key sections of the, the vote. And now here we are in 2021 saying we need a, re a renewed voting rights act. See, that's the mole. That's what I'm telling you from the beginning. That's in the attic. If you would just dealt with it, I want to be clear. Minnesota Council of Churches said, we're dealing with it now. There won't be any mold. It's not coming back. What we have to commit to now is we're dealing with it now. We're not going to come back in 10 years and play this game where we say, well, we did the best that we could for our day, but we just, it was just too big. It was just too big for us. Don't lose me. I'm done. I want to be clear. I'm not going to read the last two here. Those six degrees of segregation that I ticked off for you that you see in this cartoon from Herb Lock from 1963, 65, residential segregation, denial of access to places of public accommodation, um, unfair labor practices, denial of voting rights, Jim Crow justice, uh, second class education. That's in the native community. That's in the African-American community. Those are the wounds. They haven't changed. They haven't gone away. 
me show you three ugly cartoons and I'm going to end. The cartoon from a gentleman named Grant Hamilton from 1865. It depicts native tribes as a giant serpent. And it shows the federal government feeding them gruel. And it calls Uncle Sam's pet hands off. I just want to play this game because what we've been witnessing over the last couple of weeks with Gabby Petito, what does he put in the middle of the snake to, to white woman in jeopardy? See, look, I know I, I was all over the place today. I apologize. I didn't have any coffee. I was up late last night listening to a great lecture. So, you know, it was up past my bedtime. So you can't be mad at me. But I will tell you this right now as you look at this, right? I shouldn't be able to be saying this to you when Armo, that's from 1885 and it's 2021 and we playing the same games. He knew how to play on people's emotions in that moment. The same way we know how to play on people's emotions today. And it shows, you know, low the poor Indian whose untutored mind, right? This is disturbing. And, and, and yet at the same time, it's got him killing white settlers who are moving out onto his land in the background of the Indian schools. This was done by a young activist. The difference between being white and Indian, the epigenetics of this that, that tie back to that cartoon, which I don't have time for. This is Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray from 1956, her book, Proud Shoes, where she talked about the difference between um, poor, what it means to be, to deal with the issue of poverty, right? In fact, I'm not gonna do this justice, but I'll say this to you very quickly. The Reverend Dr. King said it more uh, succinctly than she did, so I'll put it for you this way. In his final book, Where Do We Go From Here, Cast or Community, Dr. King wrote, we made a grievous error in the way that we approach the issue of civil rights in this country. We focus so narrowly on access and opportunity, we miss one consistent kernel of truth. What good is it to have the right to eat in a restaurant if you can't afford anything on the menu? Civil rights without economic justice are dead rights. What good is it to have the right to go to university if you can't afford tuition? Civil rights without economic justice are dead rights. What good is it to have the right to live wherever you want if you can't get a mortgage? See, we can go down this line, but King was saying, this is also a problem of economics. Look, I don't wanna lose you, cause I'm done. I wanna say this to you in conclusion. I'm working on a project on the summer of 1975. I told you that our stories were connected. This is my first conversation with um, the team at Minnesota Council of Churches. This is an article about uh, anti-police uh, brutality protests in that moment. The normally moderate National Association for the Advancement of People added its voice today to a call to end police intimidation of blacks and Indians in Minneapolis. See, you don't hear that no more, but it's there. If you talk to the activists, they'll tell you it's been a problem here for, we interviewed Tony Boza uh, three days before I had my surgery. Chief Boza spent, who was chief of police here in Minneapolis from 80 to 89. He spent the first half of the interview talking about the drunken Indian stereotype and the racism and prejudice against African-Americans. And we pressed them on because we went and dug up all those cases of brutality against indigenous people and African-Americans. People forget the American Indian movement was born here and born out of an incident of police brutality. We act like they are separate and distinct movements when in fact, if you go back to what Jim Bear said in the beginning, if we start to connect the dots and put those seven deadly sins together, in fact, the article put it this way. I'm gonna read this to you. Arthur Cunningham, chapter president of the NAACP, did not mince words in a statement accusing the Minneapolis police of having, quote, declared war on blacks and Indians. But see, you know what? This is why you gotta do the historical recovery because if you don't read that, you walk out of this moment going, well, we've done all the interventions around police brutality without looking at how deep this runs in our community for BIPOC people. Me, I'm out of time. I want to end with you by simply saying this today. The big problem that we have is around invisibility. My sister said it to you in the very beginning. Uh, my, my, uh, Ayana, in terms of uh, we're on the interfaith board together. And I just want to end with you by reading to you from Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. I promise you, my last three slides. In 1952, Ralph Ellison wrote, an invisible man. And people always ask me, w w you see those t-shirts that say, stay woke. Where, where does that come from? Where, where do... Ralph Ellison wrote this in this book. I'm invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. 
Like the bodiless heads you see sometimes in circus sideshows as though I've been surrounded by mirrors of hard distorting glass. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, themselves or figments of their imagination. Indeed, everything and anything except me. Let me break this down for you in terms of how African Americans and indigenous people see this. When they approach me, they see only my surroundings, 38th in Chicago. Themselves, black man, or figments of their imagination. When I was a kid, it was the Charles Bronson, 10 to Midnight movies that gave rise to Bernie Getz, right? Black crimes, that's all you ever hear. I wouldn't dare speak for my indigenous brothers and sisters, but I imagine they could share with you the way that it gets played. Follow me here? In fact, Ellison says, I remember that I'm invisible and I walk softly so as not to awake the sleeping ones. Sometimes it's best not to awaken them. There are few things in the world as dangerous as sleepwalkers. Let me let you in on a little secret. This generation, the reason they say stay woke is they like, wake them up. We've, we've been playing games with sleepwalkers for 400 years. And what has it gotten us? A bunch of sleepwalkers pretending that they're making progressive changes. And, but I want to warn all of you about something too. Don't go into the work half awakened to the implications of what you'll need to invest in order to make it a success. Because if you do, what you're gonna end up doing is putting us in a position where the stories we tell versus the history we confront ends up creating new narratives that end up winding up in benevolent assimilation. It'll be the same story again. We just have to increase home ownership for African Americans and Native Americans, and we've done our work. Maybe it's a collective model we're looking at. Maybe if we listen to BIPOC communities, what we hear back is that we're not interested in your, um, your Eurocentric standard of home ownership, which means that if there's mold in my attic, it's my fault. I'd like a collective standard where my neighbors have to help me come get the mold out. So our whole community is healthier. Ha ha. because I don't really have to say much else. And I'm not saying it to be hurtful. I'm saying it for us to be real. I'm not saying it for us to be destabilized and not be able to work together. I'm saying it in the spirit that Curtis wrote about, that Jim Bear talked about, that Diana lay, Iana laid out for us in the very beginning, that if we're not comfortable being uncomfortable in the conversation, being able to recognize how a cartoon from 1885 speaks to this moment in such a powerful way, we're doomed. And we're doomed because we put ourselves in a position that when we talk about going in search of the lost, like the prodigal son, we wind up being the brother, standing out there going, how come you did all this for the Latino community and you didn't do anything for me instead of being where Jim uh, Bear was in the very beginning of, we got to spend some hard work figuring out how to connect the dots and weave these together in such a way that there are no more lost. That when we talk about dealing with um, the social determinants of health, we're dealing with this for BIPOC, BIPOC people in all communities of color. We're doing this in such a way that we end up understanding what we can see in this final slide. I got there. Um, from the Niagara movement from 1905. What were these men and women asking for in 1905? Promise you, last three things I'm gonna read to you and I'm sitting down. Number thing they asked for, courts. We demand upright judges and courts, juries select without discrimination on account of color and the same measure of punishment and the same efforts at reformation for blacks as for white offenders. That could be today. That's Michelle Alexander, the Jim, new Jim Crow. That's, don't say it, Yahuru, you're gonna get in trouble. People are gonna be hurt. That's defund the police. I don't wanna hear that. I don't wanna hear that either. That makes me nervous too. But that's really what they're talking about. And oh, by the way, doesn't it echo with what we heard from Chief Joseph in 1877? Take a look at where they go. We need orphanages and farm schools for dependent children, not for children with parents, for dependent children, right? Juvenile reformatories for delinquents and the abolition of the dehumanizing convict lease system. What we need, they're asking for there, we call restorative justice. We note with alarm the evident retrogression of this land of sound public opinion and the spirit of manhood rights, Republican government and human brotherhood, and we pray God this nation will not degenerate into a mob of boasters and oppressors. See January 6th. Look, 
I'm not responsible to you, so I could say what I want. <laughs> so I might take her from Jim Bear and, and Curtis and Pam later, but I'll deal with that. I could deal with that email. Follow me here, because I don't want you to lose me. This is important. Health. We plead for health, for an opportunity to live in decent houses and localities, for a chance to rear our children in physical and moral claim. It's 1905. I, it should not echo in our contemporary moment if it isn't, in some sense, a powerful affirmation of what and who we, what we hope to accomplish and who it is that we want to be. I would end with you by saying what Chief Joseph said, in this moment, good words aren't enough. It's the time for good actions. It's the time for consistent investment. It is the moment where we not only commit ourselves to a 10-year program, but we put some metrics behind it and we begin to raise the next generation to say, this is what we need to have, this is what we have to address. This is what we need you to go out and focus on. This is what we need you to burn, right? And people get upset when you use language like that because they have the image of last summer in their mind, right? But there's a health benefit to thinking about burning off the anchors and the ropes that tether us to the past in such a way that they deny that we can ever be or do anything differently than what was done yesterday. And today ain't yesterday. Today is today. And along with the Minnesota Council of Churches, it will be the beginning of a better tomorrow. Thank you. I don't think it's a secret anymore that you want to be a preacher. <laughs> like, so I'm saying that secret's out now. You're just going to have to get it done, brother. Uh, wow. Some things that I reflect on. You talk about 1991 when Washington is playing in the Super Bowl right here in Minneapolis. That was my first protest ever in my life. Freshman in college, or excuse me, freshman in high school. And uh, I remember, I remember my uncle being spat upon. And my brother, I'm glad we're getting there where we're, we're recognizing this as our fight. That our liberation is tied up in a complicated mess of connections. So, it's funny that you put that slide of the Washington football team in there because just this morning, Facebook reminded me of the only time in my life I've ever gone viral. Five years ago today, there was a uh, photograph taken. So five years ago, set the context in the NFL, Colin Kaepernick is headline everywhere. And people are taking a knee during the anthem and everything, and the, the, the black power fist is raised and all of that. And a photograph is taken of four African-American Washington Redskins players at the national anthem raising their fist in black power. I saw that photograph and I created a meme. Okay, I'm a Gen Xer. I had a, one of my millennial friends create a meme <laughs> on my behalf. Because I didn't know how to do it. Okay? I'm not as social media savvy as you are. But I created a meme and said, when you raise your fist because black lives matter while wearing a jersey that said red lives don't. And I went viral. Only time in my life I've gone viral. But we're in this moment where we recognize that black lives matter, yes. Red lives matter, 
Yes. And unless we get to the point where we're fighting this battle for liberation together, then we're echoing the same stories. So, 